And so then we can talk about a graded potential now. That's just simply a local change in the membrane potential, and it's associated with dendrites of the neuron. And it, if um, a graded potential is strong enough, it creates an action potential. So we can think of testing water temperature how, and how it can produce different grades of change. If the water is warm, a small change in the thermal receptor in your sensory receptors of your skin will not necessarily elicit you to rip your hand away, right? It's, it's just warm. It's like, oh, okay, I can feel that. Um, but it's not a super strong response. Whereas if it's scolding, a large change in the membrane potential of the thermal receptor will elicit an action potential to be um, elicited in that sensory receptor, which will get carried onto the sensory neuron, into the interneuron in your spinal cord, and then carried out into your motor neuron and motor effector so that you rip your hand away quickly. And so that electrical connection, that electrical propagation down the length of the axons was transmitted quickly because it was a large change in the membrane potential. And these graded potentials can be hyperpolarizing or depolarizing, meaning they can make the ax axons more likely to fire action potentials or less likely. And these are based on neurotransmitters. And so when we're talking about synapses, we're talking about electrical or chemical synapses. The chemical ones use neurotransmitters, whereas the electrical ones use direct contact between the cells such that ions pass directly from one cell to the next. We'll focus on chemical synapses though. These are releasing neurotransmitters from a presynaptic neuron or um, just one neuron to a postsynaptic neuron, a different neuron. Characteristics of chemical synapses are we always have a presynaptic terminal. It's basically the end of the presynaptic neuron. This is what we find in the synapse. We find neurotransmitters in vesicles of these synapses. We have a synaptic cleft. It's just the space between the synapse and the receptors. We have the receptor proteins on the postsynaptic terminal, the postsynaptic terminal of the postsynaptic neuron. And we have elimination or reuptake, reuptake of neurotransmitters from the synaptic cleft. And this can be carried out by astrocytes or other enzymes um, or even reuptake of the, uh, by the presynaptic neuron itself. So when we're dissecting this whole diagram, what we're looking at is a small chunk of a synapse of one neuron and dendrites of another neuron. So this would be the synapse of one neuron, the presynaptic neuron, presynapse, presynaptic neuron, and the postsynaptic neuron. It's postsynapse. So this is in the dendrite of the other neuron, this neuron. And so in this presynaptic terminal, the terminating end of the synapse, we have vesicles. These synaptic vesicles, because they're going to be released into the synapse contain neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are little chemicals that can elicit effects on receptors that they bind to. Think of them as ligands. The ligands and neurotransmitters, they're released via exo so exocytosis into the synaptic cleft, the synapse. And um, the synapse released it into the synaptic cleft. Sorry, I'm just trying to be uh, precise here. And the neurotransmitters will attach or bind to receptor proteins on the membrane of the postsynaptic neuron. This will elicit a change in the effect of those proteins, allowing ions to pass through, such as different ions that might be present in this synaptic cleft, like chloride or sodium or potassium, calcium, which will change the effect or make an effect on whatever neuron here is here. And a lot of this is going to be, oh, an electrical signal is passing down this axon, bing, 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 and then it releases these neurotransmitters into here, and then it continues making it, you know, it makes it such a strong reaction here that it creates another action potential, and then bam, now this one's sending an action potential. So that's kind of the premise of a chemical synapse. So when we're talking about neurotransmitters and receptors, there are over 30 different types of neurotransmitters made by various neurons. There are many different kinds of receptors that can be part of the postsynaptic neuron membrane. And this helps for control over the same effectors such as the heart. So we see this in the parasympathetic and the sympathetic innervation of different smooth muscles, cardiac muscle, or glands. 
we have the same effector organ that the parasympathetic and sympathetic uh, nerves are attaching to, but they release different neurotransmitters eliciting a different response in that organ, like we were talking about with the, um, let's just say the eye, for instance. The effector organ is the same. The different neurotransmitter released on the pupil will elicit a different response if we're with a parasympathetic nervous system versus the sympathetic nervous system. One will dilate and one will constrict the pupil of the eye uh, or the iris such that we can provide a different physiological response based on whatever the stimuli was. When we're talking about fate of neurotransmitters, once released, the neurotransmitter can diffuse and bind to the receptor, just like we saw in the synaptic cleft. It can be inactivated or decomposed by extracellular enzymes. These can be emitted by astrocytes or even the presynaptic neurons themselves. They could also just get pumped back into the axon terminal that released it. And this is just called reuptake of neurotransmitters. The nervous system is said to respond quickly, but effects are not long lasting. Effects last as long as the neurotransmitter is continuing to be available to the postsynaptic neuron. They're very quickly scavenged and moved out of there so as to prevent ex, um, like uh, just a hyperactivity or hyper hyper excitatory or hyper inhibitory effects. It's to focus your body and make sure that everything is efficient. If it lasts in there too long, issues can arise. And this is what stressful um, conditions being um, exposed to stressful conditions regularly can do. It can leave stressful neurotransmitters like cortisol and synaptic clefts too long. And this creates disorder in the brain and creates bad pathways. And that's kind of what some antidepressants are meant for to help um, deal with that type of uh, disorder in the brain. So there are classes of antidepressants known as reuptake inhibitors. And one is called an SSRI or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It diminishes the neuron's ability to reuptake serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter, from the synaptic cleft, thus leaving a longer lasting effect of serotonin on the systems that it is affecting, such as mood. And then when we're talking about all those um, aspects of syn synapses, ATP is required in different steps. So the actual production of the neurotransmitter pumping the sodium and potassium out to maintain the electrical gradient, exocytosis of the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft, and reuptake of the neurotransmitter back into the presynaptic terminal. Those all require energy. And so this is why you have to have energy for your brain to work. And also the rest of your uh, uh, nervous system. You, you have to be able to communicate all those neurons with, with all those neurons regularly such that you need energy pumping into it. So ATP is required for a lot of different aspects. Okay, so now that we got to talk about the nervous system and how it functions at a molecular and cellular level, we can get into the anatomical organization of the brain. I'm not gonna go into excruciating detail as we're gonna cover many of these structures in lab. So when we're talking about regions of the brain, we have white and gray matter. We can see kind of right here, the white matter is more interiorly located, whereas the gray matter is more in the cerebral cortex or the outside. White matter is going to be myelinated with uh, having axons of the neurons. That's where the transmission is going to be occurring. Whereas the gray matter is going to be non-myelinated. This is where the cell bodies are kept and the dendrites and the uh, synapses. This is where the decisions and all the higher level thinking occur. All the connections for, for those are made in the white matter. And we'll see here, we have ganglion and nuclei. So when we're talking about a ganglion, this will be in the peripheral nervous system. It's a bundle of gray matter. So that's just cell bodies. And you'll see those in various parts of the spinal cord. And then we'll see nuclei in the central nervous system. We'll see that in the brain. And these are bundles of gray matter. And so you can see here, different types of nuclei that we've talked about in the class. We have a nucleus of an atom, a nucleus of a cell, and nuclei in the brain. And these are just bundles of gray matter or cell bodies. So now we can talk about the sensory and motor cortexes. 
or motor areas of the cerebral cortex. And you can see highlighted here, they're on this, uh, these little areas, these little gyri. And so the red is talking about the primary motor cortex and blue talking about primary sensory. And basically what these are, are different amounts of neural feedback on how much your brain is contributing energy wise or space wise to these areas of the, of the body. And so you can see like your lips, your face, your, your fingers and your feet, uh, where the feet go, feet, genitals, and your, um, your tongue. All of these have really large um, representations in the body. And if you look at a homunculus, this is what you would look like if your brain dedicated the same uh, amount of energy to the way that you would look um, based on it, the way it, it functions for So then we can talk about the hypothalamus, which is the executive of autonomic nervous system. It's also the executive of the endocrine system as it regulates the secretion of hormones by the pituitary gland, which releases hormones that are uh, major pathways in the endocrine system. And so functions of the hypothalamus include regulating your body temperature. So like if you're too hot, you'll sweat, too cold, you'll shiver. Regulation of body water hunger and thirst mechanisms as well as sexual pleasure mood and motivation your pituitary gland is the, your master gland it's a regulator that influences other endocrine glands and it produces hormones it's controlled by the hypothalamus and the anterior portion is more endocrine function or endocrine gland and manufactures a lot of hormones and all these hormones go on to affect other endocrine glands, excuse me. And then the posterior pituitary is more like nervous tissue and manufactures hormones as well. But again, you can see the difference in different types of tissue and they do manufacture different hormones. Then we have the pineal gland. It's a small gland located on the roof of the third ventricle here, this little space. It produces melatonin, <coughs> excuse me, melatonin, and it's important for regulating sleep. And then we can talk about the limbic system, which is involved in behavioral and emotional responses, it has uh, various survival uh, behaviors associated with it like fear, anger, aggression, and pleasure. It's a very primitive system. It's a, you can see it in uh, reptiles and fish. So it evolutionarily is very primitive. It also links your conscious intellectual functions of the cerebral cortex, the outside, to unconscious autonomic functions of the brainstem. And your amygdala, hippocampus, Thalamus, hypothalamus, basal ganglia, and cingulate gyrus, not all shown here, but they're all aspects of the limbic system. Then we have the brain stem. You have your midbrain, your pons, and your medulla that make up the entirety of the brain stem. Your medulla contains sensory or motor tracts. Your spinal cord blends right into it. And it's called your vital center because it regulates very various vitals like your heart rate, blood vessels, and respiration. And then the cerebellum is kind of like the little brain. So you can kind of see here the difference. It's like this little brain underneath the entirety of the cerebrum. And so it's attached to the brain stem underneath the occipital lobe, the purple. It functions to compare uh, sensory feedback from the periphery through the spinal cord. And so it helps with precise smooth movements your equilibrium and maintaining posture for balance. And again, a lot of the structures that I just went through are things that we're not going to focus on in lab. We will focus on other aspects of the brain uh, anatomy in lab.